If you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're beginning a series this morning called Christianese, and it will carry us through the month of October, looking at words and phrases that maybe we understand what they mean, but certainly people who aren't at church uh, get confused about. And honestly, a lot of Christians have a hard time with some of these phrases, maybe misunderstanding them. And so we're going to look at, uh, through the month of uh, October this week and then all of next month, look at some of these words and phrases together. So th this mission team just came back, uh, the five of them. Three of the five actually went with us uh, last summer to England. And while we were over there, we, we found out that there are some words and some phrases that don't necessarily translate over, even though we speak the same language. And so we're at this, this community event. It's kind of like a Heath Harvest Festival, but it, it's their equivalent to it over there. All these booths set up and and Becky Miller is there and uh, sits down next to some young man and just wants to start up a conversation and says, oh, I like your pants, you know, and, and the little boy just got real sheepish and kind of backed up a little bit. And thankfully, his mom knew to interpret a little bit. And she said, your trousers. She likes your trousers. You see, what, what his mom knew and Becky had forgotten was that in England, they call uh, their underwear pants. And so she had just complimented this young boy that he had really nice underwear, and he just didn't know what to do with that, you know? But there are some things that just don't translate, just don't make sense to us, and, and we think we know what they mean, but maybe we don't have a full grasp, or maybe we've been misusing them, and, and we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at some of these strange phrases. The church has plenty of these phrases that we throw out and that we, we speak and we say that we don't necessarily always understand. As a matter of fact, we probably sang some songs this morning that had words that we sang and that we love and that we believe, but if we sit and think about it, we're just not exactly sure what we sang. We know it's good, we know it's godly, we know it's biblical, but we're not exactly sure what it means. I was thinking of a, a Mercy Me song, and there's a particular one that pops into my mind when I think of these words. And, and it's, it's a good song, and it's a very biblical song, and in it has like consecutive words that if anyone who's not in church listens to probably goes, I don't even know what he just said. So as they're singing, they say, you are holy, righteous, and redeemed. You know, that sounds wonderful to us church people, but when you're not familiar with church, you think, what is holy? What is righteous and what is redeemed? There's some other phrases as well. Tim Hawkins has one in particular that, that I, I find a good illustration. So I've got just a, a brief video to play uh, this morning to, to show you kind of how we misinterpret some words or misuse some phrases. I think the way, I think the way we pray is, it, prayer, is a, prayer is a powerful thing, but I think it's when you grow up in church, it's just you hear prayers all the time in different styles and stuff, little quirks that people have when they pray. I don't know, little phrases that I don't understand to this day. But we use the phrases, but we, that's just what we heard growing up. We think that's just the right thing to say when we pray. You know, like hedge of protection. You ever hear that? You hear that a lot. Hedge of protection. Damn, we are praying a hedge of protection around you, buddy. That's right, a hedge. Around you and your whole family. A hedge, huh? I don't mean to complain. Is that the best you can do? How about a thick cement wall? With some razor wire on top of that bad boy. Hedge good set of clippers get right through that thing. I'm sure the devil's got a set of those. I mean, you think a hedge is going to scare the devil away? What is this greenery? I can't get through that. Move that bush! My greatest weakness is landscaping. How did they know? That's how the devil walks like this. Whoa. He has a pointy tail. He doesn't want to step on his tail. And he talks like a game show host. Fantastic. You get the turtle wax. Get the last 30 seconds ever happened in your life. Now, how many of you all are going to pray for hedge of protection around your pastor this morning? I really appreciate that. 
You know, we have these phrases, these words that we use. We don't even know why we say them or what they mean. And so we're going to clarify some of them. Uh, one of them that, that I learned very quickly in seminary, and, and no, this is not the necessarily the, the word and the phrase because it's not one you've heard of, uh, probably not. But I remember one of the first theology classes I took in seminary. I'm 18 years old, fresh out of high school, and, and thinking, here I am going to learn how to be a minister. And, and at my Bible college in this theology class, they talk about the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. And I thought, am I supposed to know that already? He's talking like I know what that means, you know? And I had no clue. You guys are looking at me like, I can't believe he just said that in church. This is the <laughs> phrase that, and so here's what it means, right? And this kind of goes along with our message this morning. Penal, think penalty, right? There was a penalty that was substituted by Christ. Your penalty was substituted by Christ dying for you. And it atones you. That's one of those fancy words that means you're made into a right relationship with God. So Christ made us in a right relationship with God by substituting in our place for our penalty. That sounds great, but we have no clue what these words mean. Now, as blank looks as you all gave me when I threw this phrase up there, those are the blank looks you often get when you say some of these very common phrases to your friends and family who are unchurched. And so we're going to spend some time looking at them. And, and to be honest, some of them are, are going to be uh, shown new to you as well. This morning, we're looking at the phrase, born again. To be born again. What does it mean to be born again? We hear this in songs, we hear this in, in sermons, we, we hear this in, in conversations with Christian friends. You have to be born again. Well, so-and-so, they're, they're a born-again believer. What does it mean to be born again? So each week, I'm going to give you a few synonyms, other words that maybe have some confusion but are similar to our, our main word. And so if you're taking notes, you can write these synonyms down. Uh, a synonym for being born again would be a believer, a Christian, converted or saved. There may be more as well. For instance, someone who has accepted the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ would be born again. So you can use that in your conversation next time you're hanging out with some friends. But what does this word mean? What does it mean to be born again? In John 3, 3, we get the verse where we hear this phrase from. So in John 3, uh, Nicodemus has come to Jesus and he's asking him some questions. And Jesus tells him this in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus replies, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so we use this phrase all the time. I want to look at the first six verses of John chapter 3. And really, I would encourage you to read the first about 21 verses of John uh, on your own. Uh, kind of go home and, and read through the story of Nicodemus and kind of hear what Jesus is telling him. But let's look at the context of this phrase, born again, by reading John chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asks the same thing you and I would ask. How can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so here we have Jesus trying to explain what it means to be born again, and perhaps you're as confused now as you were when we started. What does it mean to be born again? Nicodemus asks plainly what the obvious question is. I'm an old man. Am I really supposed to, to come out of my mother a second time? Can I climb into her stomach and be birthed again? It's an impossibility. And Jesus explains in verse 6, I think, is where it's clearest. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, but whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. You see, we must experience a second birth, not physically, but a spiritual birth, a new birth where we are a new creation. 
You were born once in the flesh, and now the calling is to come to Christ. You must be born of the Spirit. Well, that still isn't perfectly clear, but at least helps us to understand the metaphor. So as we look this morning at being born again, I, I want to give you a definition of being born again. And if you have your notes, you can kind of fill in blanks as we go. Take notes on the side at some different truths as we come and talk about what it means to be born again. What it means to be born of the Spirit. And the first thing we understand in being born again is that being born again implies that you are a different person than you used to be. So you are now a new person that you are born again. Every time there is a birth, a new person enters the world. Three months and two days ago, a new person entered the world in my son Josiah. A brand new individual that although he was in the womb for nine months and existed, he is now introduced to the world afresh. He is a new human being. And so we know that being born implies a newness, a freshness. And to be born again implies that you now have a new and a fresh and a different life. You are not the same individual. As a matter of fact, we, we read in Scripture that the old is gone and the new has come. In, in John chapter 3, verse 6, we, we see the flesh is flesh, but you must be born of the Spirit so that you are spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. When we talk about being born again, What we are saying is that we have new life. Our old life is gone. The old us does not exist any longer. We have a new life. And so all of those sins in your past life, all of those things that you were caught up in, they no longer apply to you. Now, do you still have consequences on earth? Yes. However, you are no longer held accountable before God. You are forgiven because of your new birth. This is a refreshing idea that in Christ, your sins, your wrongdoings, the things that separate you from God no longer have a hold of you. They no longer weigh you down and you no longer have to pay the spiritual price for them. You are no longer separated from God. You are a new creation, a fresh creation, one in which you no longer have the sin punishment in your life. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, listen to this, so when we are buried with Christ, die to our sins, when we put our sins aside, we are given a new life in Christ, raised from the dead to a new life. Why? So that we may walk in the newness of life. Being born again means that you are trusting in Jesus Christ and you no longer are the old individual self. You are a new creation and you have a new mission, a new purpose, and a new way to walk. So our definition to be born again is to be given a new life. You have a new life. Maybe this morning this is encouraging to you because you look at your life as it currently is and you're not happy with it. You wish you could just ball it up, throw it away, and start over. Well, I cannot promise you that all of the consequences on earth dissolve when you accept Christ and when you trust in Christ. What I can promise you is your standing with God is completely different. You are no longer seen as the sinful individual. You are seen as a a righteous, made right person. Someone who God will enter into his kingdom. Someone who can have a relationship, you have a fresh start, a new life. The second thing we have to understand is that there is only one way to be granted this new life. It's not as if we can can start over on our own. It's not as if we can find different methods and techniques that work for us to kind of give us this fresh start. There is one way. In John chapter 3 is the most famous verse in the history of Bible verses. And it's in this story with Nicodemus that Jesus says in John 3.16, For God loved the world in this way, 
that He gave His one and only Son, that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. This is the one way. Jesus says God loved the world so much that everyone who puts their trust in Jesus Christ has this new life. In verse 17, it talks about condemnation, how how in Christ we are no longer condemned. Uh, and, And so then verse 18, we read, anyone who believes in Him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Jesus says, if you put your faith and trust, if you follow Christ, You no longer have that guilt associated with your sin. You have a new life and you're made new. But there's only one way to do it, and that's through faith and trust in Christ. Anyone who does not believe already stands condemned in their old way of life. So the methods that we try, the the things that we try, and we're, we're working so hard to do what's right and be a good person, all of those don't matter. The only thing that matters, the only way we are granted this newness of life, the only way we are what Scripture says, born again, is believing and trusting and following Jesus Christ. That's why in John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one has new life. No one is born again. No one is able to have a right relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ. I wonder how many different techniques we try to earn our way into a right relationship with God. Maybe you're here at church this morning out of guilt. You're here because you think you should be doing it and and it's the right thing to do and and you want to please God and, and, and be a good Christian person. And, And so you're trying really hard to do the right thing so you'll show up to church. Can I tell you that nowhere in Scripture does it say showing up at church is how you come to the Father and receive new life. Maybe you you like to serve. You have service projects, and so you volunteer at the hospital, or or you're helping at soup kitchens, or you're volunteering at the school, and you're you're doing all of these things to help other people. You're giving to to the needy, or you're giving to organizations that are doing good, and, and you think, God, I'm being a good person. I'm doing and I'm giving what I have. Nowhere in Scripture does it say if you pay the right people or serve the right way, you will come to the Father. There is one way, only one, that we can have this new life and be born again. And that is through putting our faith in trust and following Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And so our definition is to be born again, to be given a new life through faith in Christ. And you can even write through faith in Christ alone. There is one way to be born again, one way to have a fresh start, one way to have new life, and that is through Jesus Christ. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? Just believe. Just just have faith and trust. And everything magically gets better. But our final truth this morning is that this new life is both easy and difficult to accept. I'd be a really, really poor pastor if I stood up here and said, pray a prayer and your life will get better. Because I can give you a testimony that Although I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there have been times in my life that have been extremely difficult. There have been some times that have been difficult because of my faith in Christ. It actually made it harder for me because I was sticking to my faith. And so this morning, I have to tell you, it is an easy decision to make. It is as simple as putting your faith and trust and following Christ, but But that decision is not an instantaneous moment decision that you make and then it's done. It is a lifelong commitment. And anything that you make a lifelong commitment to is hard. It's difficult. You don't get out of lifelong commitments. It is something you constantly battle through. And so it is both easy and difficult to accept. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, Jesus says, If you're tired, if you're weary, come to me. 
Why? Because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I will come and help you out. If you need rest, come to Christ. It's easy to follow him. All you have to do is trust. But then he says just later on in Matthew 24, verse 9, telling the the disciples about the end times, when, when trouble is coming, he says, they'll hand you over to be persecuted, and they will kill you. You'll be hated by all the nations. And why? Because of my name. Jesus says the reason why you'll be persecuted is because you're a Christian. The reason why you'll be hated is because you're a Christian. Sometimes the reason why life gets difficult is because you're growing in your faith and it is difficult to maintain. Putting your faith and trust in Christ, following His will for your life is both easy and difficult. It's the easiest decision you'll make. It's as simple as right now yielding yourself and saying, that's what I want. But let me warn you that it is a lifelong commitment. And tomorrow, when you struggle, tomorrow when bills come due, tomorrow when relationships fall apart, tomorrow when your job is a mess, tomorrow when life hits you square in the face, your faith must remain. It is a constant battle and a constant fight. And so our definition to be born again is to be given a new life through faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. It doesn't take listening to my messages very long to realize that these two words, Lord and Savior, come up a lot. Because these words contain the gospel message. The easy part of putting your faith in Christ is accepting Him as Savior. Most people can readily admit, I want you to forgive my sins and make me not accountable for them anymore. Take away my guilt, take away my suffering, take away my pain for my sins and my wrongdoings. Free me from what I'm indebted to because of the wrong I've done. Forgive me, that's easy. Right now, I could get every single person to say, I want to trust Jesus as Savior if it means my sins are forgiven. That is the easy part of salvation for most people. But it is extremely difficult to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. Because that means you're trusting Him to lead and guide you. And what He says, you will do. There are times that God leads us to do things that don't make sense, that seem that in the moment seem to hurt us, seem to be the worst idea when our idea seems so much better. And putting our faith and trust in Christ is saying, God, I know ultimately you know what's best. And while it may be hard now, it's what's best in the long run. And I'm going to be obedient and do what you call me to do. Accepting Christ, being born again, and being given this new life requires putting your faith in Christ to forgive your sins and making a lifelong commitment that every single day you will be obedient to what God calls you to do. For many people, they're not ready to put their faith and trust in a Lord. It's easy to be forgiven, but it's difficult to put your trust in the absolute King. As we close this morning, Romans 10 verse 9 tells us, If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, He is ruler and He is King, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that is to forgive your sins and be your Savior, you will be saved. In one verse, the gospel message is telling you, you must trust Christ for a new life. You must put your faith in him as Lord and Savior to experience the forgiveness that's promised. And experience the new life that guides you where God calls you to go. This morning as we think about this phrase, born again. I wonder if we ask ourselves, are we born again? Are we living in a new life? Or does our life look the same today as it did a week ago and five weeks ago and five years ago? Have we really put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ so that our life is not the same as it once was? We are different people committed to following this God, committed to following Jesus Christ. And if not, this morning I wonder what's keeping you. What's holding you back from releasing your old life 
calling out on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, to save you from sins, and asking Him to guide your life as Lord. So we come to our time of invitation. Why don't you take this time to pray right now? Lord, I need you for my salvation. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this truth in Scripture that we have a new life, that we are born again, that we're no longer our old selves, that you have given us a new life, one that is not hindered by sin and guilt, one that is not responsible for our own sins because our sins have been paid for. Lord, I thank you for the truth of being born again. Lord, I pray that we would examine our lives this morning and ask ourselves, do we have a new life or does our life look pretty much like it always has? Lord, I pray that you would give us the confidence and the courage to come to you for our our salvation as Savior and Lord. Lord, we know that you are the only one who gives new life. And so this morning, right where we're at, we confess our sins to you and ask forgiveness. And we pledge our hearts to do what you call us to do. Lord, we thank you again for the salvation we can have. And now we pray that that those in here would embrace it fully. And that those who have embraced it would then share it clearly so that others could embrace it as well. We ask all of this in your name. Amen.